Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this week we are uh, episode 62, recorded on November 20th, 2013. If you want to see all of my episodes, go to my vid blog, walkinpark.com. Lots of interesting things there to see We're deep down in the blog. Okay, well, last episode, we went to the Six Mile Creek Natural Area in Ithaca to a, um, a walk and talk that was sponsored by the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and the City of Ithaca Watershed. And uh, the thing we did then was to look at, uh, well, here's, the, here's a picture of the watershed, actually, of starting down the lower left to Ithaca and then... Uh, down to going out to the upper right is the uh, the watershed, much of the watershed. You can see some reservoirs there of Six Mile Creek, and that's actually the city's water supply. And there's a natural area which is designed to uh, be both to make the area accessible to the public and also to protect the watershed. And these were some of the folks gathering at that walk and talk, and uh, we uh, had a very good uh, program there. What we mo mainly looked at then was uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid. See if we could find it in the watershed. And that's a very destructive um, insect that kills hemlock trees, kills them all. And so we went and after a, a talk about it, we went and looked for them and indeed we did find them in the watershed. They're in many of our gorges. Uh, if you look at the upper center, you can see little white dots on this hemlock twig. And, uh, and when things get really bad, it can look like that. So we're gonna take a, um, a moment here and look at a video uh, with a little bit more information about the hemlock woolly adelgid here. So um, this is produced by the state of Massachusetts and we'll just go right to that. The hemlock woolly adelgid is an invasive pest that threatens our environment, economy, and the beauty of our urban and rural landscapes. You will find it exclusively on hemlock trees. Hemlocks are cone-bearing evergreens, some of which grow over 100 or 200 feet tall, but many are often much smaller. Hemlock bark is grayish, with sometimes reddish hues, and its twigs have little bumps. Its flat needles are about half to three quarters of an inch in length, alternately arranged, shiny green on top and duller green on the underside, with two white stripes. To detect the presence of hemlock woolly adelgid, keep these facts in mind. Hemlock woolly adelgid is almost microscopic, but from fall to spring, its telltale egg sacs can alert you to its presence. These distinctive white structures are about one eighth of an inch in diameter and look like tiny cotton balls attached to the underside of hemlock twigs right where the needle meets the twig. There are a few things that may be confused with hemlock woolly adelgid egg sacs. Spittle bugs produce a bubbly white mass, but the texture is wet, not cottony like the adelgids. Globs of pine sap can be brownish white, but are smooth or sticky, not cottony. Finally, elongated hemlock scale is a pest which attaches to the needle, not the twig. If you think you have found hemlock woolly adelgid, please document and report your find to local authorities. Thank you for helping to protect our trees and forests. Okay, so just a little review there of the hemlock woolly adelgid. We're going to return now to, um, well, let's see, actually you can find out more about uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid in our last show. If you go to my blog once again and uh, go to episode 61 and look for Gorge Tree Killers, that's the name of it on the blog, you will uh, learn a lot more about the hemlock woolly adelgid. But now we're going to return to the Six Mile Creek Natural Area this time with Roxy Johnston on the same day, the 9th of uh, November, to find out about changes in the water supply for uh, the city of Ithaca. So um, here's a two, picture of two reservoirs. Why does the city of Ithaca have two reservoirs? It only uses one. They're more than 100 years old. This was built back in like 1902, 1903. And um, so what's the story here? Why are there two? Why are they only using one? And what is happening to the reservoir now? So there's the upper reservoir. That's the one that's used. So what's happening now? So um, we're going to go right to back to uh, listen to Roxy Johnston 
of uh, the city of Ithaca. can set that up, but one of the last processes we have to do is we have to clean our filters periodically. The filtration is near the last step, and there's a little bit of particle matter and chlorinated water when we clean those. That comes to the lagoons here, um, and it settles out, and we dechlorinate it. This process is being upgraded as part of the new facility. Um, gravity and um, natural drying processes and that sort of thing are slow. Um, natural drying doesn't work out so good in this climate. Um, so we're going to a mechanical process. Um, again, more details if you want them uh, anytime. The water plant itself sits up the hill there on Water Street. Um, probably, you've never driven down that road unless you're a frequent um, walker in this area. Um, one of our best security measures is no one can find the place. <laughs> But Even it's though it's a, called Water Street. I know. <laughs> well, the sign is a little smaller and it's a different color than all the other street signs in town. <laughs> it's just right by it. Um, it's over 100 years old. Uh, it was built in 141 days. Um, it's worked great. Um, but over time, EPA is always monitoring new potential contaminants. They're always making stricter and stricter um, treatment requirements to make sure that the drinking water supply is safe. And so places that are working fine now may not be able to meet new conditions. And so we have to we have to build a new water plant. Plus, there's also just age of the infrastructure. So that's going on. Um, we get our water from about two miles upstream, um, it's a 60 foot reservoir. It's not public. <laughs> someone Supposedly, asked, right. someone asked me about the the work on the public access road the other day, and I had to make sure we understood it's not a public access road. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can go up to the 60 foot and they just turn around. Um, there's a, a, a lower reservoir that we don't use anymore. Um, that's the young folks call second dam. Uh, we call it the 30 foot. We're very creative. Those are the heights of the dams. Um, that, I don't know, we always talk about maybe doing some work in there just for safety issues because we are getting to where now there are hundreds of people in the summer congregating and swimming and, and it's not really safe to do that in front of a dam. Um, there's no real plans there, but in the watershed, we do have a supply line that goes to that, that larger reservoir. It hasn't been maintained for well over two decades because this decision on whether to rebuild or merge with Bolton Point has taken well over two de decades, and the entire time maintenance has been deferred. Um, so there'll be some work in there um, so that we can get to some of those concrete boxes. If you've seen them as you're walking along, you'll see a pipe. You'll see these concrete structures. They look like they're fancy homes for critters. They're really supposed to be um, blow-offs um, for uh, silt and sediment that might settle in low parts of the pipe or air that might get in high, high parts of the supply line. And mostly we can't find parts of them and we can't um, exercise the, the valves. So that will all be repaired um, in the next year or so. So you'll see some activity. Um, we, are, we are sensitive to the fact that it's also a natural area. And so we'll use smaller equipment and we'll do our best to limit our impact. But while it's going on, you'll definitely notice some impact, so bear with us. Um, so that's about it. The main map on the end of the, of the truck there, if you're curious, is the whole Six Mile Creek watershed. Um, we, are, we are right down there at the edge of town um, where you enter into it. Um, this map on this side, if you ever want to take a cruise of it, is the Six Mile Creek Natural Area. It's city-owned property. It's not all within the city um, municipal boundaries, but it's all city-owned, and it's to protect the drinking water supply um, primarily, and, and then also to provide this natural area. Um, I think that's uh, it in a nutshell, and I don't want to hold this up and get started. Can I ask yeah. you one quick question? Yeah. What is the status of dredging <laughs> Upper area up here, area. So that upper reservoir, uh, the dredging will start next year sometime. That's one of the maintenance uh, items that's been deferred for a long time. Yeah. Because um, so that's it, a mess up there, isn't it? It's largely silted in. Yeah. Um, it's scouring just to go into the intake pipe. So it will be dredged so that we get better settling and um, a better water quality coming into the treatment facility to begin with. Yeah. And so I guess one, one major message I kind of like to to put out there is when people think about taking care of watersheds, um, drinking water plants and wastewater plants, a lot of people think of them as like, you know, whatever comes in, we treat it, we take care of it in the box, and then it goes out and it's good. Or it's, you know, supposed to meet all the standards necessary. 
<laughs> it's a lot easier to make sure you meet those standards and it's a lot cheaper if what comes in the door is clean or cleaner. And so that's where we can all have an impact on that, is protecting the quality of the source water. So, Roxy, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sure. So do you, do you have any plans in place for managing the, the watershed, the lands around the watershed? Well, the, the main plan is that we own it. That was the purpose of buying all of the property. It won't be developed. Um, and it's a natural area instead of a park. So even the trails and public areas are, are pretty natural. They're not really maintained. Only the smaller entry area is maintained for folks with limited mobility issues and it provides them some access to the water area. Um, but other than that, there's not an active plan. Um, we have talked, and we'll talk about Hemlock Willie Adelgid. Um, if that is in here, and it might be now, um, it certainly probably will be in the near future if it isn't. It could cause a negative impact on water quality. The Hemlocks are on the steeper slopes. They hold the soil. If they die and are removed, we can get more turbidity and more um, issues in the watershed. Uh, so the city forester is actually looking at um, doing some surveys in here and she'll be looking for some volunteers who want to help uh, find out where those are and, and create maps. So um, anyone who's interested, I can give you some contacts later. So there's that kind of um, watershed management plan uh, in the works, but mostly it's keeping it natural and not altering the landscape. Okay, so as Roxy mentioned, uh, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid well, we did discover earlier, uh, was in there, is in the uh, Six Mile Creek um, watershed. So uh, they will be surveying that area and they will be needing volunteers. That's a very important thing is to find out first where it is and then how to deal with it. So let's go take a look at some of the artifacts of the uh, history of the uh, uh, dams and the watershed and the pipes and so forth uh, that go back over a hundred years. So we went out for a little walk and check that out, and uh, we'll join Roxy again as she talks about that farther upstream. Mm -hmm. which is what we're going to start doing. 
start down with the rest of the system. <laughs> uh, so that's what you'll see here. A uh, little tidbit I didn't add um, when I was talking about the blowouts, uh, boxes that you'll see on the upper pipe. The reason we would get low spots and high spots in the pipe is because, again, this was like 1902. You'll see that date stamp on some of this pipe. They didn't have that great big machinery with the laser levels. They had, they had men. So the ladies didn't have to come do this. <laughs> and they had nice little hats they wore too and vests. I don't understand that. But they had men and they had mules and they had dynamite. Mm -hmm. And so the pipe literally goes like this out, down. It's not a real nice directional pipe. But it's in great shape, so we're going to leave it as it is and just work with it. So that's that story. <laughs> that's no function. Though. No function. That's not this lower stuff you'll see in the street. All the way up to the bottom of the second dam. Okay. Well, thank you, Roxy Johnston. Um, well, as we noted, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is here in our gorges and so forth, and uh, there are things that uh, can be done. But there's another tree killer that's on our doorstep, and that's called the Emerald Ash Borer. It's not in Tompkins County yet, but it's nearby. So uh, maybe I'll get a chance to show you a map of that later, but it kills all manner of ash trees. And um, let's take a look. What are we facing and what can be done? We'll take a look at a, um, a short video from the New York Invasive Species Program uh, to introduce this subject. This bug can't be solved. It's just plain and simple. It is small, less than an inch in length. Colored a striking glittering green, the emerald ash borer under any other circumstances would be considered beautiful. But to the almost 900 million ash trees across New York State and 7.5 billion in North America, this tiny non-native insect represents a devastating threat on a monumental level. Ash trees are an important part of the northeastern forests. As we know in New York, uh, there are many places where there is almost entirely ash, especially in the wetland areas. Um, and it's, the emerald ash borer does not stop. It just it seems to kill every single tree. The insect was an unwanted import from China, most likely hitching a ride in wooden packing crates. First discovered in Michigan in 2002, the ash borer quickly spread throughout the U.S. and Canada and has already killed over 50 million trees. The insect's attack is insidious and makes it very difficult to detect in its early stages, which is one of the main reasons it is proving so hard to stop. They lay their eggs on the bark, the larvae hatches and burrows into the bark of the tree, and it eats that tissue, basically girdling it or cutting off the flow of nutrients down to the roots. So essentially, they're starving the trees to death, then? They are. They are indeed. They're just starving the tree. Uh, this one's just about to dive into the wood or it'll pupate and then it will change into an adult in the springtime. Given their reclusive nature as they perform their deadly mm -hmm. work, it is always too late for the tree once the larvae have begun their infestation. But other healthy trees can be saved by insecticide applications if action is taken quickly enough. One reliable way to spot the invaders is by looking for other external cues. If you're in, uh, in an area where there's woodpeckers, the woodpecker foraging on the larvae of the tree, that's a really good indicator. You see that, those little holes that they make when they reach into the bark and grab the larvae out. For those who discover an infestation on their property, the realization can be shocking. For one local landowner at ground zero of an invasion, the need to solve the problem extends well beyond his property to the surrounding community. I hope uh, uh, to uh, try to save whatever trees we have, not only for my sake, but for all the property owners uh, in the whole area. I understand that this is a bigger problem than just San Tadio's uh, problem. Uh, it's a problem throughout uh, Chickawaga and Lancaster, Depew, and other parts of the state. But I'll try to do my, my part to, uh, you know, to mitigate the circumstances. Although the bug is a strong flyer and is able to travel on its own, its spread has been greatly aided by man and can therefore be limited by taking care to never move firewood. 
but the spread we feel is almost entirely uh, over long distances by inadvertently people carrying firewood around. So it's really important at this point for people to start realizing that to protect our forests, we have to stop moving around firewood. It's just something we can't do anymore. As with any invasive species, public education is one of the most important weapons in the arsenal to battle this horrendous invader. Well, this is a really important issue. And, uh, but people don't need to panic right now. It's like we need to sit back and, and really educate ourselves, figure out where our ash trees are, and look at our options. Uh, and, and that way we'll be prepared. Uh, there won't be a frantic rush uh, to a disaster. And, and also look to the future. Taking you to the outdoors, I'm Terry Belke. Okay, that was Mark Whitmore of Cornell. And he was on the uh, um, November 9th Cougar Lake Watershed network um, walk and talk at Six Mile Creek. So let's go back to that and see what he had to say about it right on that spot. with them. Uh, the Emerald Ash Borer started in the Detroit area. A uh, very interesting story that, you know, I guess, okay, uh, good to be politically aware of how it got here. Um, basically, we think it came in wood packing material. And you know how much international commerce there is, right? Wood packing material is very common. I was actually giving a talk in Niagara County a couple of years ago. And so it got started in the Detroit area, and there's, I mentioned that it probably got started in the early 90s, maybe late 80s, we're not sure. And afterwards, a fellow comes up to me and sort of meekly says, well, I think I brought it in. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Tell me the story. And he said, well, I'm a retired automotive engineer, worked all my life in Detroit. And you're right. The early 90s, late 80s, early 90s is when we started bringing in tons of parts from China. Auto parts are heavy, and they come in wood packing crates. Uh, the story about it in China is interesting. It's like you're always thinking about, okay, native bugs. Native bugs are in control, right? And in China, uh, the emerald ash borer is in control. They have resistance by the host trees, and they have natural enemies. Two things we don't have here in America. Well, the Chinese species aren't really that, you know, beautiful stately tree that we have here with our ash trees and so they took our ash trees and planted them in China for street trees and that's when the emerald ash borer decided it liked them and killed them and waste not want not what do you do with the lumber you turn it you, you make packing crates and ship parts over to America that's I think that's a scenario that that makes a lot of sense to me so you know I guess the the lesson from that is that we're at the beginning of, of this assault on our ecosystems and that we really have to be cognizant of the dangers that are out there and the fact that they'll continue as long as we continue to buy cheap goods from overseas. Uh, and I don't see that stopping any time. Uh, what it did do though was wake us up as a profession uh, as to what's out there. We didn't expect to see anything like the emerald ash borer as an aggressive forest pest. There's hundreds of species in the same genus and here in North America they don't cause problems. In fact they actually are good in the ecosystem because they kill trees but they kill trees that I think are meant to come out. They're weak and you don't want the weak individuals breeding in a population. So they actually perform a very important ecosystem service uh, in the native situation. Uh, but then you get this wacko bug come in. There's no resistance, no natural enemies. It's had its way. Um, I have hope, though, and it involves a 50-year or 100-year plan. We have to be smart. Um, and I think in, in, in the, you know, I've been working with these bugs now for, geez, a while, and it's been pretty depressing. You, see, you go to areas in the Midwest, as you very well know, you see all the dead ash trees. I mean, here in New York State, we have more ash trees than any other state in the nation. Uh, some of the some of the counties have up to 28 percent of their trees there's ash. Um, here in the in the southern tier, ash are everywhere, um, and unfortunately, they especially like to come into areas with, of disturbed habitats. They seed in very readily, and those are usually in areas of human infrastructure around houses, power lines, roads, and so 
we're gonna, we have so much rural forest land here and people build their homes in the forest that the human impact of these trees dying is going to be huge. Uh, you know, and quite frankly, I don't think there are enough uh, arborists here in Ithaca to take care of the problem. And when it hits there, it's going to hit. It's going to hit hard and strong. Probably, we'll probably have. Oh, you know, I'm just guessing wildly. Maybe 10 years to deal with it, and then all the ash will be gone, and and that's it. Unless you protect your ash with insecticides, which are very effective. Um, I have a three-point plan for saving ash, and that involves number one. Preserving the genome. Preserve the genome by collecting seeds and by preserving magnificent individuals across the landscape so that you have seed available once this thing moves through. <coughs> Number two, work on breeding resistance in our native species. And the Forest Service is working on that right now very hard. And uh, I hope they have great success. They have great tools. And number three is to get biological controls in place. And they're working on that right now. It's, it's a thankless task because there's so many of those emerald ash borer out there and they're moving so quickly. You're not gonna really see the impact of the biological controls until the emerald ash borer has gone through and you have very few individuals out trees out there and then they might become effective. But without the biological controls, the long-term possibility of bringing ash back onto the landscape is, is, is a non-starter. We have to have resistance, biological control, genetic diversity to maybe after the emerald ash borer has moved through, bring ash back in the landscape. There is hope and I think you have to focus on the hope so that you know where to go to put your energy. If you just throw up your arms and say, all's lost, why bother? You're going to lose them all. My, my objective is to bring ash back on the landscape in its full glory as it was in the past. I'll probably be dead by then, but who cares? <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good picture of what we're up against. We're going to lose our ash trees, but there are things we can do to uh, help uh, save the uh, um, uh, at least some of the trees and uh, create a future for the forest. So lots of big impacts like that. Let's take a look at a map of uh, New York State and adjacent states, and the red dots are counties where um, emerald ash borer has become established and is spreading. This is uh, fairly current. Notice that it's in Steuben County and it's in Tioga County it looks like and not uh, officially in our area, Takas County, but close. But I remember a couple of years ago someone said they found emerald ash borer just over in uh, Watkins Glen State Park. So we'll see. It's over in the uh, Hudson Valley and it's in uh, a little bit into New England and so forth, and up in Canada. So if you want to find out more about the, uh, these invasive species, not just tree uh, insects and so forth, but all kinds of invasive species, including aquatic organisms and um, diseases and so forth, you can go to uh, nyis.info, which is NYIS stands for New York Invasive Species. And um, that's a big website with lots of information and videos and um, uh, up-to-date um, status. So uh, that's all we have for today. I want to thank you for joining us. Let me get down to my final slides here. So this is, again, uh, Walk in the Park, Episode 62, recorded on November 20th, 2013. So have a good week. We'll see you soon.